Good morning, everybody. I hope you've had a better week than I have. <laughs> Just saying. Holly's had a terrible week as well. Uh, so, you know, it's good to be honest, isn't it? And just in case any of you think that people on the platform, you know, who might look a bit more together, <laughs> don't have bad weeks, we do. My husband's in Kenya. That might have had something to do with it. Tim's in Kenya. I've been in Kenya with a team for 12 days. They're having a great time seeing lots of breakthroughs, mi uh, miracles, um, healings, as well as an incredible reception to the material, the, 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 the training that they're doing with the clergy. Andrew and Nikki are away in Devon slash Cornwall for a week, and lots of the rest of our church are away on half term. Anyone else go heading off later on this week on some nice little break, or are we just the ones that are left behind? <laughs> So um, today is Ascension Sunday. We've managed to get all the, you know, 45 minutes into our celebration without mentioning Ascension. But today is Ascension Sunday, and uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about that. But uh, firstly, I, I would love to know, um, actually we haven't got time for, for feedback, but what makes you, if anything, shout at the TV or at your laptop or at your screen? Not, you know, the fact that it's not working, but when you're watching it, you know, is there anything that kind of stirs you to react to it? Um, you know, maybe, maybe you're a very restrained Brit in the way that you watch your, your screens and you wouldn't kind of be invited to be on Gogglebox because, you know, it's a bit boring watching you watching your screens. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, my, in my family, um, it's particularly, it's the sports stuff, it's the sports victories, it's the sports defeats that, you know, get particularly the boys, and actually my daughter, I'm probably the odd one out in my family, get them shouting, cheering, booing, you know, expressing their frustration. I'm pretty sure you won't guess what it is that gets me kind of going at the screen. Uh, I am a bit, you know, strange, as many of you know. Uh, but it is this. It is watching people driving cars in films, staring at their neighbour, having a long conversation with them as they are driving. <laughs> and I have to say, there I am, shouting at the TV, shouting at the screen, saying, watch the road! <laughs> Look where you're going! Turn your face round and look forwards! <laughs> and maybe, you know, it's because that's quite relevant to me. It's not that I do that when I'm driving, but I do do that when I'm kind of walking down the street. I have been known to bump into people because I've got my face down looking at my phone. I actually just nearly walked into the door this morning as I was walking over to Trinity House because I've got my head down and I'm not looking where I'm going and I bump into people, whatever. Now, what's this got to do with Ascension? I hear you cry. <laughs> <laughs> Or maybe you're not thinking that. But the thing about Ascension and what I want to, um, us to look, look uh, and think about this morning is that Ascension is essentially the event that makes us and inspires us and reminds us to look forwards. As we do this journey called life, the temptation is to look in all kinds of different directions, isn't it? So we can look inwards. We can spend a lot of time looking inwards at my stuff, my feelings, my emotions, my struggles, my you know, opinions, my desires, my dreams, my weaknesses, my failures. I can spend a lot of time looking downwards at my plans, at my diary, at my agenda, at my to-do list, at my problems, at my dreams, at my screens, at my bank balance. You know, all kinds of things can draw my attention downwards. I can spend quite a, little, quite a lot of time looking sideways, sideways at, at this person that has got it wrong and this person whose mistakes have made a difference in my life or this person, you know, that I'd like to, you know, sort out. Or, <laughs> or I can be looking sideways in this direction at the needs of, of my family or my friends or my work or whatever and get kind of, you know, fixated on, on looking sideways this way, or I can, I can end up looking at the person over here or the people over here and, and seeing, oh, the grass is greener in your life. You know, you've got it better than me. Um, I like your house, it looks bigger. Or your race that you've been called to run, it looks better than mine, whatever. Or you've got it more together, you know, looking at his life. And we can also spend a lot of time looking backwards. You know, maybe at the stuff that we regret the stuff that we wish we couldn't happen, you know, trying to wonder about or think about or reflect about, revisiting, trying to find our way back into that past so we could change it. Or maybe we can look back in nostalgia, you know, it, particularly in seasons of loss, I think, you know, wanting to revisit or recreate a past that actually God is inviting us to move on from. We can look in all kinds of different directions. And it's not that looking in any of these directions is wrong. Please don't hear me saying that. There are seasons where Jesus invites us to look in because he wants to deal with something. 
There are seasons when God invites us to look down because he wants to, us to talk about this stuff with him, you know, that's on our to-do list or my agenda or my diary or on my dream list or whatever. He invites us to look back at times because he wants to heal us from some wounds or release us to keep being able to move forwards. He invites us at times to look sideways so I can be inspired by this person or learn from this person or actually because I need to forgive this person. It's not wrong. But the problem is when our glancing in these different directions turns into a gaze and our focus gets stuck. Here's a couple of verses, and we are going to come on to the ascension, that you might not have read uh, very recently, hidden in the book of 2 Peter 3, verses 11 to 13. He says this. This is Peter, Jesus' best friend, one of Jesus' two best friends. He says this. Uh, Sorry, it's not going to come up on the screen. The main reading we'll do in a moment. What kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forwards. As you look forwards to the day of God and as you speed its coming. Or What does that mean? Are we hoping that the day of God, the day of Jesus' return, the day where God calls time on the world? Are we looking forward to that? That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, whichever happens first. Whether we meet Jesus face to face or whether he returns to earth. So what Peter is saying is, guys, who ought we to be? We ought to be living with the end in mind. With the day of God, the day we meet Jesus, the day we see him face to face, or the day he comes back, you know, when I die and meet him then, or when he comes back, we ought to be living with that in mind. Why? Because it shapes the way we live today. And by the way, Peter wasn't writing to a bunch of retired people in an old people's home. (laughs) But, you know, (laughs) in their last sort of months and weeks of life. He was writing to a bunch of people like us of all ages, and they lived with this sense of expectation that they could meet God at any point in time. So let me ask you this morning, let's ask ourselves as we just think about what ascension means, this strange word ascension, and we're going to look at, it, look at the event in a minute. If you want to get your Bibles out, we're going to turn to Acts chapter 1. What does it mean for us? Are we living, you know, looking forwards to that day, to, you know, that moment? Are you actively looking forward to heaven? Have you got the day that you meet Jesus in your sights? Is that something you think about that I think about regularly? Have I got one of, you know, one eye, as it were, on the future whilst I live in this present moment? So here's today's passage. Acts 1, uh, verses 3 to 11. It'll come up on the screen. During the 40 days, so this is after Jesus has been crucified, it's after he's come back to life, and Luke just gives us a a little glimpse before the book of Acts carries on about the the beginnings of the church as as to what Jesus was doing. During the 40 days after he suffered and died, he appeared to the apostles from time to time, and he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive. He was quite busy with a purpose in mind. He wanted them to be absolutely sure that he was alive. And he talked to them about the kingdom of God. Why did he spend time talking to them about the kingdom of God? Because it was what he wanted them to know about. And he kept going. He spoke to them about it before he died. He spoke to them about it after he died. Once when he was eating with them, so there we are, a very human activity. He didn't have this ethereal body that couldn't digest food or couldn't absorb food. He was eating with them. Luke wants us to know that. He commanded them, don't leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised. That's the Holy Spirit, but we can't talk about him this week because we're talking about him next week. (laughs) I'm joking. Um, Don't leave Jerusalem until the Father sends the gift that he promised. As I told you before, John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, like a bunch of nags, I should imagine, because they were desperate to know, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? That's what they really wanted to know. What's going to happen? What are you going to do? When are you going to do it? When are you going to sort this world out? When are you going to make everything okay? 
He replied, the father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they're not for you to know. So when you see somebody, fortunately we don't see many of them in Cheltenham anymore, with a placard saying the end of the world is nigh, Jesus is coming back tomorrow, or whatever, we, we get these predictions from Nostradamus or whoever. It's not for us to know. Nobody knows. But... You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Cheltenham, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After saying this, he was taken up into a cloud while they were watching. Note that phrase. Imagine what it must have been like, literally, to watch your friend you know, his new body, but it was a body nonetheless, literally leaving the earth. I mean, I would love to, wouldn't you love to have known? <laughs> wouldn't you have loved to have seen that? What would it have looked like? You know, leaving the earth and literally ascending, that's where we get the word from, as they were watching, until they could no longer see him. As they strained to see him rising into heaven, Two white-robed men suddenly stood among them. Men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way that you saw him go. Now, let's remember that when we see a word repeated in the Bible, the author is trying to make a point. (laughs) They're trying to emphasize either a name or a place or an event. What are the points that Luke is trying to make in the account of this story of Jesus ascending back into heaven, going back to heaven. I'm going to pick on two. Firstly, I think what he's trying to emphasize for us all is that heaven is a real place. Heaven is a real place. Jesus is there now. That's where they saw him going to. They watched his physical body, his resurrected body, going to heaven. And then they were staring at heaven, wherever heaven is, and wondering you know, where he was. And then the angel said, why are you looking at for him in heaven? He's going to come back from heaven. And he's going to come back in exactly the same way. No doubt, you know, clouds will be involved. I don't know. But I wonder what you believe about heaven this morning. Really good to talk about heaven. I don't think we talk about heaven enough. What do you believe about heaven? Do you believe that it's a real physical place? Is that what you believe? When I was uh, younger, I used to think, you know, I used to think about heaven and I used to sort of be absolutely terrified of it because I I think I did think it was a physical place, but I think I thought, you know, it was all to do with clouds and harps and cherubim and, you know, singing forevermore. And I quite like going to sleep at night. (laughs) I quite like the end of the day. (laughs) I quite like closing my eyes and thinking, yay, I don't have to think about anything. So the notion of kind of living somewhere forever, and it basically being about clouds and harps, was actually quite depressing. (laughs) I don't know if you think about heaven as a real place. Maybe you believe it's something else. Maybe you believe it's a kind of lovely biblical kind of metaphor, figment of the imagination that's just meant to make us feel better when life is tough. And life is challenging. Marx said this, religion, it's probably familiar to you. Religion is the opium of the people. He subscribed to a worldview that many people would hold today, that it's some kind of false hope. It's a religious construct to offer us, you know, a bit of comfort, you know, on a bad day or, you know, when we're standing by a graveside. And actually, it's a bit of an insult to human intellect and dignity. Or maybe you're not sure. Maybe you're not sure about what you think about heaven because you haven't really thought about it very much. Like I said, I don't think we talk about it very much, actually, in the Western church. We're all about now and seeing heaven come to earth. Personally, I think Luke records this moment because he wants to make sure that we know where Jesus is and that he's in a physical place. And he had witnesses to prove that he was going to this physical place. And so if you don't know much about heaven, I'd encourage you to read about it, you know, Do a Google search in your Bible. Look up all the verses that talk about heaven. I can recommend you some brilliant books on it. It's an exciting thing to dig into. But Jesus, here's the thing. Jesus wants us to know about it. He talked about it as a real place. He talked about it a lot, actually, as a real place. He described it in lots of different ways. And then he demonstrated in broad daylight that he was going there. He could have done it, couldn't he, when it was dark. Why not say a final farewell 
You know, boys, I've loved you, and women, I've loved you, I've looked after you, I'm off, you won't see me again. And then he could have gone when it was dark. But he did it in broad daylight. Why? Because he wanted them to know and remember where he was going. And I think, you know, he describes heaven a lot uh, in, in the New Testament, in the parables. He described it as being like a party and like a great banquet and it being like a feast and a, a fantastic celebration. All the things he says about it are epic. But I think, as these disciples watched him being taken up into the sky, I think they would have remembered his words uh, that are recorded in the book of John. And I'm sure it was all deliberate, because I'm sure he wanted them to remember what he'd said about heaven. And he said this, John 14, verses 2 to 4. And I'm pretty sure the disciples would have been thinking about this as they watched Jesus leaving. He would told them this just before he died. There's plenty of room for you in my father's home. If that weren't so, would I have told you that I'm on my way to get a room ready for you? And if I'm on my way to get your room ready, I don't quite know what he meant by that. Is he going to decorate it? Is he kind of going to a heavenly Ikea to make, you know, sure there's some nice furniture there so it's, you know, got the kind of wallpaper and curtains I'd like? I don't know. But he's going to get the room ready. And if I'm on my way to get your room ready, I'll then come back and get you so that you can live where I live. I'm pretty convinced that the disciples would have been remembering this. I'm going there to get your room ready, and then I'm going to come back. And that's what the angels say. He's gone, but he's going to come back. And as he left them on earth, as he leaves us on earth, to live his purposes out here. This is an image, this is a truth that he wants us to remember, to keep our eyes fixed on, to look forward to, because it's meant to shape the way. And it does actually, how much we think about it, how much we look forward affects the way we live today. But back to what he said, in, I just want, you know, wanna, wanna, for those of us that haven't really thought very much about heaven, I want to say one thing about it this morning. Before I come back to the implications of what does it mean if we keep our eyes, you know, looking forward. Jesus is talking about heaven in John 14 as home, as God's home. I wonder if that's how you think about heaven, as being God's home. I don't know if you've got, whether you like being in your home. Most of us have different experiences of home life, you know, when we were growing up, and home life currently. I don't know what you, what that you know, word home, what connotations it brings up for you. Maybe your experience of home hasn't been particularly good. Maybe your experience of home is great. But think about the best ingredients of an earthly home. Great meals, great conversations, great games, a lot of fun, you know, um, good smells, family gatherings, parties, whatever. Think about the best experience of a family home. There's a longing in our hearts for that, which is why when home goes wrong, it's so painful. Home is meant to be a safe place, isn't it? We can go out in the day, and we, you know, whatever life throws at us during the day, when we come home, everything's meant to be as it was when we left, a bit predictable, a bit familiar, safe. Home is meant to be a safe place for us. You know, it's why when it goes wrong, it's so destructive. Home is meant to be the place where we're known and loved, where we can be ourselves, where we can be honest, whatever we've had to deal with during the day. It's meant to be a place where we're known and can be ourselves and can be our, you know, our authentic selves and to be loved and accepted as we are. Home is a really significant place, isn't it? It's why it can set us up for greatness or it can totally sabotage the way we live because it's so significant. And Jesus is saying that heaven is God's home. It's where he lives and where he reigns. And because it's God's home, it's exhilarating. It's going to be exhilarating. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be epic because think about the best human home experience you can have. This is going to be like exponentially better because it's God's home. There's going to be no tears there, no crying, no disagreements. There's going to be adventure, there's going to be beauty, there's going to be wonder. We're going to feel more alive there, more known, more loved, more accepted than we have ever felt on this earth. Luke wants us to remember that heaven is a physical place. It's not a lovely idea on a bad day. 
And Jesus, in, in ascending in front of their very eyes, wanted them to remember, and he wants us to remember, because it's recorded for us in the Bible, that if we live with our eyes looking forward, it's going to shape the way that we live today. And actually, just like when I'm walking forwards and I've got my eyes <laughs> you know, ahead of me rather than down looking at my phone... You know, I'm less likely as I walk through this life. We're all walking through this journey of life. If we've got our eyes looking forward, we're less likely to get stuck. We're less likely to get distracted. We're less likely to go wrong, to get lost. We're less likely to crash into someone or something else. I think it's amazing. I mean, you know, Luke could have undermined his credibility, couldn't he, by writing this extraordinary event in the book of Acts. I mean, who sees a man go up to heaven? You know, if he wanted something to undermine everything else he wrote in the book, given that it's right there in chapter one, he's done a good job of putting a slightly sort of weird event in there. But he thought it was that important. So friends, are we living with the end in mind? Are we living with that day that we're going to see Jesus again? Either when we die or when he comes back. Are we living with it in mind? Is it something we think about, you know, on a daily basis? Is it what shapes you know, the way we live. I want to highlight a couple of things that actually flow from, you know, we will see these, these elements in our life the more we have and we, the more we look forward to that day and keep it in our sights. The first is this, that if it's God's home, there's an RSVP, isn't there? There's not always an RSVP when somebody invites you into their home. You know, when I invite people around, you know, I expect them to say, yes I'm, yes, I'm coming, or no, I'm not. You know, obviously my friends, the people I'm in relationship with, you know, it's slightly different. But there's an RSVP to God's home. And actually, if we really believe that heaven is a real place, and there's an RSVP that we need, that we need to respond to this invitation into relationship with God and into his home for eternity, that will influence the way we live in terms of our own relationship with God, you know, responding to that RSVP to relationship on a daily basis rather than trying to earn our way in. And it will affect the way we relate to and pray for the people around us, won't it? There was a story is told of a a lady called Ruthanna Ruthanna Mexica. She was was a professional singer in the States. She wrote a book. And uh, she tells this story in her book that she was invited to uh, sing at this awesome, sort of very high-profile wedding in uh, Chicago at the top of this uh, huge building, and uh, the, the, the wedding reception was on the top two floors. And all the guests were sort of on the bottom of those two floors. And, uh, and then there was this announcement that the wedding feast was going to begin and the guests needed to move from the, the bottom of the two floors uh, up the stairs to the top of the two floors. And at the top of the two st- floors, the, the bride and groom started making their way up to the wedding banquet. And at the top of the two floors was a man with a book in his hand and there was a satin ribbon and it was all very lovely and cool and, you know, slick. And this man had uh, the, the, the name of all the guests that had, had RSVP'd in the book. And when she and her husband got to the point of, you know, entry to this, this banqueting area, uh, they gave their names and the guy looked in the book and he couldn't find their names and she spelt out the name, you know, that's what we do next, isn't it? Spell it out <laughs> to, just to make sure that, you know, they've heard right. And the ne- the, he couldn't find the names in the book. And he said, I'm really sorry. You know, that was his job to make sure that only the people uh, in the book were allowed into the reception. I'm really sorry. Your name isn't in the book. I'm going to have to ask you, you know, to leave. And so at that point uh, in the reception, they were, you know, taken kindly to the lift, but they weren't, you know, able to go into the actual wedding banquet. And, and she talks about this fact that as she was in the lift... And, you know, after this stony silence, and the husband says, you know, darling, what happened? What went wrong? She sort of remembered, oh, gosh, I was busy, and I just thought I would RSVP. And then I thought, well, I'm the singer, you know. I'm I'm the one with the professional job. I'm the one that they needed at the reception. Of course they're going to, you know, doesn't matter whether I RSVP'd or not. And it suddenly struck her, because this woman is a Christian, that actually, you know, that was a real-life reflection of Jesus' story of the banquet And the fact that there's an RSVP and there were all these people that, you know, just were too busy to RSVP or somehow thought that it would turn out differently and that, yeah, they would make their way into the banquet at the end anyway. And friends, if we live with the notion that there is this RSVP, that an RSVP to relationship with God to end up living in... I mean, for those who don't want to reply yes, you know, we don't talk about, 
you know, hell very much, do we? It's, you know, we, we, we talk about how can a God of love send people to hell? And, you know, let's just be clear. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't want to claim to know exactly what hell's like. Jesus uses a lot of metaphorical language in the Bible. You know, when I say, you know, Jay, you were on fire this morning. You did a great job leading us in worship. I don't actually mean he was burning in flames. <laughs> you know, it's a metaphor. But actually, God doesn't send anyone there. He gives us a choice. You know, I get a choice if I park on a double yellow line. <laughs> I get a ticket. I think they're out to get me because I always get a ticket when I park on a double yellow line. And it's my choice whether I park on the double yellow line and get a ticket or whether I don't. God gives us a choice. He wants everybody to RSVP, yes. But actually, if we don't want relationship with him now, he's not going to force anyone to live in his home with him when they die. But friends, if we, if we live with this as a reality, if we look forwards and keep our eyes fixed on this truth, it will influence the way we pray as much as anything for the people around us. Do you know, I have, an, I have a, an older family member and uh, we in the family have been praying for him for years, very cynical, very angry with God, very opposed to him, you know, doesn't want to talk, you know, has, has been pretty rude to, to a lot of us about faith in the family. And I saw him in the last you know, 10 days. And as a family, we've been praying, God, soften his heart, soften his heart, soften his heart so that he might respond to you. And I had a conversation with him um, in the last 10 days and uh, just asked him, you know, I haven't spoken to him about this for a long time, but just felt like, you know, I needed to put this, up, put this invitation in front of him again and asked him, have you, have you RSVP? That wasn't quite my language because he wouldn't have understand it. I said to him, have you made your peace with God? And there was a pause, and he said, I'm not sure. And I said, I said to this family member, I said, because you are going to stand before God one day. Do you know that? And he said, yeah, I do. And I said, and you are going to have to talk to him about your life. Do you ever think about that? And he said, yeah, I do, a lot of the time. Now, nobody's been telling him that. I'm pretty convinced. I think the Holy Spirit has been doing his work of reminding him to look forwards, because that's what the Holy Spirit does. And I was able to, to talk to him about the fact that well, you, can, you can make your peace with God, you can RSVP, and you can know that you've done it so that you're welcomed you know, into his loving arms now and into his home forever. And he said to me, how do I do that? And we had a conversation about how do we do that? But friends, if we don't believe this is real, if we don't have our eyes fixed on the future on a regular basis, we won't even be praying those prayers, let alone looking for the opportunities, will we? And that's why the world wants to persuade us, oh, heaven, it's a kind of lovely, comfortable, ethereal idea. So that's one of the ways that it makes a difference to how we live. The other way, you know, as Jesus rises in front of them in the daylight so they can see where he's going, knowing that heaven's a real place and that he's going to come back. I think he expects it to make a di you know, and wants it to make a difference to the, to the way we kind of live on a very, you know, daily basis ourselves. Because Jesus, you see, mentioned a lot, didn't he, as he was on earth about storing up treasure in heaven. Yeah, we've all heard that, haven't we? Storing up treasure in heaven for ourselves. Here's a couple of things he said. He blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you, if you're my followers. But be happy, be glad, because a great reward awaits you in heaven. Matthew 5, 11. Matthew 16, he said, The Son of Man is going to come into his Father's glory with his angels, and then he'll reward each person according to what they have done. He talks a lot about his home, the future, and the stuff that we can invest in. Jesus might be going to go and get it ready, but I think he's probably going to you know, arrange the rewards for us that actually we have ended up with. Now, it's not a rewards for good behavior. Like I said, there's an invitation into God's home. But there is rewards for the choices that we make here because we love him and because we trust him, which is great news if you make some tough choices in this life because you love him and you trust him. Jesus is saying the choices that we make here is going to make a difference to our experience of heaven. It's like he says, I'm taking note now, 
not as some cross schoolmaster, but as a loving father, because I'm not going to let you lose out. So it's like he says, that time you were ridiculed because you loved me, or you shared your faith with me, I saw that, I took note, and there's a reward waiting for you in heaven. That time you persevered, and you trusted me, and you chose my way instead of your way, even though that was tougher, there's a reward for you, waiting for you. That sacrifice of money you made, the way you invested your resource in advancing the kingdom, I've put treasure in your account, but you're going to see it when you're, when you're home with me. That risk you took, that opportunity you took, that thing you turned down because it would have compromised your integrity, that person in poverty that you blessed, that price that you paid to forgive someone or keep your mouth shut, that choice you made to stay in a marriage when you could have left it because you love me, because you trust me, there's a reward waiting for you in heaven. Isn't that good news? <laughs> Isn't it good news? It's not just, you know, neglected or overlooked and he goes, oh, well done. He's a loving father and he rewards us. Friends, <clears throat> if earth is not our home and heaven is our home, well, I'll change that around. If, earth, if heaven is our real home, what it means is earth is not. But the world wants to tell us that earth is our real home. So the world wants to tell us, invest all your resources in this home now. Make it safe. Make it comfortable. This is your life. Make it lovely. You know, make it big. Make it good. Make it everything you can do because this is all there is. You know, I like to think of the, what, the footwear I wear in uh, uh, my home. I wear slippers. You know, the, the world says, put your slippers on and make what you've got here now the best it can possibly be. Jesus says the opposite. Jesus says, home, look ahead to home. You're going home, but you're not there yet. So don't put your slippers on in this life. Put your walking boots or your battle boots on. Because actually, slippers aren't the right footwear for this world. Tough boots are. You can put your slippers on when you get there. Friends, have, I, you know, I think have, you know, there are probably lots of things that the Ascension you know, is all about. It's an event that I think we don't talk about very much. But let's let God remind us this morning that heaven is not pie in the sky when we die. You know, I hear that said sometimes in churches as an encouragement to make the most of the here and now. But we can only make the most of the here and now if we're looking forwards. That's what this is all about. So let's do that. Let's do that again this week. Let's let this truth of the ascension where Jesus has gone, where he's coming back from, let's keep our eyes looking forward so that it makes a difference to how we live Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday, remembering, you know, maybe being, having a renewed commitment, that's what Kingdom Come is about, to pray for those around us that don't know him, to pray for opportunities, to just share something of his reality, his love with them. And to inspire the choices, the tough choices that we you know, need to make, on a, sometimes on a daily basis, remembering that there you know, is where we're headed, there is where we're going, there is where we can put our slippers on. But in the meantime, we need to have our boots on, our walking boots, our battle boots on here for the sake of this world.